Hello, I'm Yen Fosterville, Director of Marketing Communications here at the Science Museum of Minnesota. Thank you all for being here and um, for joining us today in this race, Racism and Health panel. Uh, these programs are part of the Science is All of Us a campaign to help museum vid visitors build their understanding of complex and layered racial and cultural issues. This year, Science is All of Us explores the disparities found in our communities as well as in the museum and uh, with an emphasis on health. And also, I'm here to welcome all of you. Thank you again, our wonderful um, panelists, uh, who will help me dig into some of the disparities in care and coverage for Asian Pacific Islanders in Minnesota today. So I'd like to start with a little context, and uh, we can dig into it in a few minutes here. So approximately 5 to 8% of our state identifies as part of the Asian community. And this actually represents a diverse group of people with varied backgrounds. However, we can make some general observations about health care access and equity concerns as they affect Asian and Pacific Islander communities in Minnesota. Good health and health care is an essential need for all Minnesotans. Without health, health insurance, accessing and affording good health care is very difficult. Minnesotans generally have high rates of health care coverage, and in 2019, over 90% of Minnesotans had some form of health insurance. But people of color and Native Americans are around two times more likely to be uninsured than white people in the state. It's difficult to generalize about such a diverse group of Asians and Pacific Islanders in Minnesota, in Minnesota, but there are some areas we'll highlight in our conversation today. Specifically, our panelists today are focused on preventative care, cancer screening, and COVID vaccinations. So I'm delighted to introduce our panels of professional uh, who will share findings from their work within Asian communities in the state. Um, to my left here, we have Mary Zhang, is a vaccine outreach director with the Minnesota Department of Health. We have Du Zong Yang, is a health educator and COVID-19 community liaison with the Minnesota Department of Health. And Marie Tran is a systems change coordinator for the SAGE program at the Minnesota Department of Health, which focuses on breast and cervical cancer screenings. And we also have Katie Ciprasu, um, is a program manager with the Lao Assistance Center of Minnesota. Welcome panelists again. <laughs> and so we'll begin with um, Mary. We'll start with you. Um, in your role with the state, I'd like for you to share some of your perspectives on some of the healthcare issues um, you're encountering and addressing on a statewide level. And if you can give us any unique situations that you've encountered you've encountered with vaccine outreach in recent years. Yeah, thank you so much, Yen. Um, and also thank you to the Science Museum for inviting us as panelists. Um, in my role as vaccine outreach director at the state level, uh, we've seen, um, with especially the vaccine rollout, the programming, uh, many barriers that the API community has faced. A lot of that really comes down to the technology barriers, the language barriers, and then just a lot of misinformation, especially when COVID-19, the, the pandemic hit the US. Uh, there were a lot of misinformation about the vaccine, about the virus, about care in general. And so we've seen all of this um, and learned from those lessons and taken that to our uh, programming that rolled out for vaccination in 2021. Mm -hmm. And from that, we really saw that uh, because the rollout of the vaccine program had a lot of scarcity in terms of uh, the number amount of vaccines available, this also brought a lot of fear and concern and questions from the community uh, towards the state. And so with my role uh, at the state, we were able to address a lot of questions and concerns, especially around vaccines and uh, just a hesitancy uh, to make sure people receive accurate information. And from those scenarios, I would say that one a big piece is uh, that we continue to talk about is access. And especially for our community who speaks a second language and a lot of our community members are also immigrants as well or re refugees. 
And uh, finding and navigating the system is really challenging. And so being able to support and be that person on the state level providing information, addressing concerns and questions, um, really help support community members get the access that they need to find the vaccine that they can choose of to protect themselves and their family. Um, so th that, those are some of the examples that we've seen more on the state level uh, with programming and also with vaccines um, in the early time of the pandemic. But that's changed so much now uh, because we were able to address a lot of barriers because of those concerns that were raised up and also addressed. And that's really good to hear. Um, and Duzong, as a health educator and a community liaison, can you expand on Mary's position and any other observations you'd share as uh, you develop language around COVID outreach for the API community? Yeah, um, so with the misinformation, people we noticed that people were also delaying care, so they um, even if they were sick, they wouldn't go to their clinics or their hospital to get treatment. And um, so that was delaying their care. And so that's something that we also uh, created messages so that people don't delay care. Um, we also saw that, um, you know, during COVID, when people had, when people, when people had COVID, they didn't know how to, um, quarantine, especially, you know, living in a multi-generational family, it was really hard to kind of figure out, okay, you know, how do I separate myself from my other family members so that they don't get um, COVID? And so we had to like develop messages around that too. And I think we have like a great communications team at MDH. Uh, we always ensure that, you know, we're using plain language so that it's easy for our translators to translate because some of the words that exist in English, we don't mm -hmm. have it in our languages. So um, we would have to describe the what the word is instead of you know creating or saying saying the word in English. Um, we during early on in the response, uh, a lot of the uh, staff at MDH had to uh, take on additional roles such as um, uh, being the person to review the translated materials, also being the person to do voiceovers because um, you know a lot of our Asian communities they prefer uh, videos and that's you know they don't some of them don't read and so it's just a lot easier um, and better for them to just you know watch a video and um, hear, they're here, their own language, um, educating them on, you know, COVID and what to do and everything like that. Um, we also work with trusted community organizations. They also help review translated materials. And so we, we take a lot of consideration in our community and what, uh, and how to meet their needs. So expanding on creating messages for the community and the things that we've been seeing, we, we saw that uh, a lot of the messages for the API community were not being delivered in a timely manner compared to English. Like if something changed on a Friday, people who know, who knows English will receive that information on Friday, but then the people who don't speak English you know, we have to take that the message and get that translated, which could take up to a week. And so that's something that um, that's really frustrating for us as well as for the community is to receive the correct information in a timely manner. And so I think one of the things that we've done at MDH to strengthen and to break that barrier is um, our cultural communications team. Uh, we have staff there who are experts in their um, community language and it's basically like an in-house translator translation service where they are able to translate um, messages that need to go out immediately and so that's something that we're trying to um, to do to help the to help all communities who don't speak English that's great so I mean COVID's 
impact on communities around the state has been really varied. So thank you so much for everything that you do for our communities. Um, so let me just shift the gears a little bit. I want to talk a little bit more about preventative care and cancer screenings. So uh, Marie, let's start with you. As a systems change coordinator with uh, the MDH, you spent years finding ways to increase access to cancer screenings. Uh, can you talk about some of the hurdles that you've overcome? Sure, thank you so much for inviting us here. Uh, well, community means um, different meaning to a lot of people. Community means a specific cultural group. Community can be mean a, 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 the clinical group that we work with, that the clinical community. So as a system chain coordinator, I work with a lot of different organization, communities, uh, the cultural community, the clinical community, and also our own institutions. Um, and system change take a long time. It's possible when we actually work together and intentionally and acknowledging there are differences and willing to collaborate together and make things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, the COVID proved that. The COVID have really uh, shown us the way that we can do the, we can work together between institution and community organizations. Uh, ordinary people can make change, but at the same time, we, we also have to maintain that momentum. Uh, we building the trust. The trust is happening and we need to be mindful and intentionally keeping that moving and building on that. So for preventive care to happen, uh, especially in our, in our community, Asian Pacific Islander, we have a saying, hell is goal. You don't have health, you don't have wealth. Mm -hmm. But we don't go to the doctor for checkup or preventive cares if we're not sick. So that is a culture thing. We only go seeking care when we're really, really sick. And it really sometimes can be critical and or too late before we actually seeking care. So teaching our people in the community that going to a doctor, uh, having um, a checkup is a wellness checkup. So to make sure that you are feeling well and you, you're not sick. So that is something take a lot of um, educations. So from the institution, like at the health department, we have the free cancer screening. We call that SAGE, a cancer screening program. It provides pro, uh, program pay for, for women 21 years and older who are low income. Not too low, the income pretty high, the lower income, and if they are uninsured, mm -hmm. they can use our program to get breast and cervical screening. And we will pay for every screening from the initial uh, visit all the way to additional workup until that woman have a diagnosis of what happened. And if she needed treatment for cancer, then that when the screening will stop. So we pay for a lot of screening, but a lot of people don't even know about it. Especially our Asian community, sometimes we don't know anything about it at all mm -hmm. uh, because of the language barrier. And everything in English and Spanish at this point uh, we are really trying hard to get more language out there. The Vietnamese language, uh, I share with you the material, we have done that. Uh, and we have some Hmong language. But then also, the Asian Pacific Islander, there's a lot of community are not reading material. They are more of a traditional, oral traditional. So you, you need to be able to create material that can be related to the people, look like them, sound like them, and something that they can actually understand. So we're working on that. Yeah. So there's a lot of work that's going on, and, um, and we have to work at a different level. We're collaborating between the State Department, the clinic that I work with, a lot of clinics, um, FQAC, which is the community health clinics that I'm working with, and also with community organizations like Katie at the Lao Center to bring the information back into the community and then have the community using that and then educate themselves. So I'm gonna have Katie talk to you more about that. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah, and it sounds like there's already a lot of collaboration. So please, Katie, if you can just tell us what challenges do you face within the law community you know, regarding healthcare access and preventative care? 
So right now we are collaborating with Sage as well as Park Nicollet and we've been doing mobile mammograms each year. We usually do around like six mobile mammograms. Um, we find that it's hard for a lot of the middle-aged women to come do um, a mobile mammogram at the Lao Center due to work schedules. They're unable to take time off and some of them are uninsured. So what we try to do right now is collaborate with a lot of different clinics throughout the Twin Cities, such as like in St. Paul, or whether it be in, up in War Road, or down in Worthington, um, to partner with them and let them know that our mission is to help increase the screenings in the AAPI community. So what we have done in the last, uh, I'll say 20 years going back, um, in, the, in the Asian community, we did get the grant, and that's what Katie is doing right now, with the grant from the health department called EHDI, which stands for Initiative for Health Disparity um, Prevention. So what we, we, we do outreach to the community, we provide a lot of education about mm -hmm. health issues in general, uh, preventive care, um, health literacy, health literature, and cancer screening. So right now, specifically, Katie doing is uh, getting women to get pregnant cervical cancer screening through the grant program. So we collaborating with healthcare clinics, community health clinics. Right now, we co um, co collaborating with health park uh, park um, mobile mammography, so we do like six, seven events a year at different locations in the community. Sometimes it's at the Lao Center, sometimes at the churches, sometimes at the, a certain health fair mm -hmm. to get women to get that mammogram done. Because without that man standing there at the, at the event, these women might never go to a clinic and have the mammogram done. So that was the, the, the purpose of that mobile mammography. So we can go to where the women live or if they gather somewhere that way, they can actually start doing that. And that's kind of training the people to get into the habit mm -hmm. of getting preventive care without being sick. So I, I think that's, that we're trying to change the mindsets of the community. Is that what we're doing right now? So yeah. And I love that, the way that we're really trying to meet people where they're at, because that's definitely something that we need we all need to be working on right. is meeting everybody where they're at and so the, there's still a lot uh, to unpack here um, there's a lot of really good information and I know we could spend another hour just talking about all the wonderful programs that you've been implementing but I'm going to ask each one of you to just share just share one, I know it's gonna be hard, uh, one project that you've worked on to bridge some of the gaps in healthcare that you've identified today. So now I'm gonna start with Katie, and then we're gonna work our way back to Mary. Yeah, so right now we are implementing a community health liaison program at the Lao Center. Um, we are expecting to train 50 and have at least 30 community health liaisons um, throughout the Twin Cities, just to go out and bring awareness to um, how important it is to do the preventative cares for like your breasts and the cervical, as well as um, HPV, how important it is to know about that and educate yourself at a young age and potentially getting vaccinated. So that is one thing we are doing right now. The one thing that uh, I feel is that it's most important is continue that collaborations. Uh, we have a momentum. We need to continue nurturing that and then keep keep moving with it because mm -hmm. education, educating the community in general, all of us, take a long time and you keep doing that repeatedly until things change. Uh, um, preventive care also meaning having COVID vaccinations. So that is another message that we need continue to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, for me, um, I think that we're always looking for opportunities to bring health services to the community and, and meet them where they're at, at their most convenience. And so um, today at the Science Museum, we have um, our COVID vaccine clinic. And so we're very thankful for the Science Museum as well as um, our, the staff who are 
who are running the vaccine clinic today. Um, they're here to help vaccinate people who haven't been vaccinated or who need their boosters or anything that, or if they have questions, you know, we have staff here. Uh, we also have lead poisoning, uh, lead testing to, mm -hmm to test for lead poisoning for kids and families. And so um, also thankful for the Science Museum and um, the organizations who are part of that, uh, who made this happen. Well, thank you <laughs> for bringing all of that here to the museum, because our visitors definitely, that's very important information that they need to know. Yeah, it's definitely a team effort on every level. Absolutely, and Mary? Yeah, I'll just also add that um, that we've seen how the pandemic has uh, really increased communities that have been disproportionately impacted and really seen the effects of that. And so then we've been able to apply all of our previous knowledge working with the community, like Marie uh, shared about mobile units and applying those, adapting those to the different communities that have the, the ability and the knowledge to, to find information and resources. And so one of the ways that I've been able to, in my role, support uh, just some of the systems on uh, state level is really making sure that our community organizations and also uh, different uh, providers in terms of vaccine vaccinators are able to use state um, resources and become a part of state programs so that they can go out and vaccinate their own communities. Um, so we were able to sign on a variety of community clinics that became vaccinators and now support some of our COVID community clinics out here in, in the metro area. And so um, being able to bridge those gaps for community and state programs is uh, something that we're really proud of. We're really here to make sure that whatever is happening in the community is also relayed back to the state so that we can make sure that our systems is are working for the community um, and really led by the feedback that we are hearing. Uh, sometimes systems don't work for everyone, but the feedback that we receive, they, they're really helpful and they, co they go back to our teams and our leadership and we really uh, change them to make sure that we are also changing and impacting people's lives. And so we're here for everyone. I love hearing that. There's so much positivity um, that you're all sharing with us, and it's all very impressive. And I know we're just hitting that tip of the iceberg, but um, and there's a lot of factors um, in you know remediating some of the um, the factors that uh, prevent Asian communities in Minnesota from accessing and uh, preventative health care and screenings um, that they really need. So Mary, if you can give an individual an advice on how to look for those right resources in their communities, what would that be? Yeah, um, we are living in changing times now, especially our generation. And uh, I really wanna encourage people that uh, they should seek information that is accurate so that they can fully make their own choices on their own health, um, just so that we can make sure that people's well-being are based on the choices that they make and that they are well-informed so that they can make those choices for themselves and their family as well. So highly encourage people to seek accurate information. It's a really good advice. And Duzong? Um, yeah, just expanding on what Mary said, um, you know, reach out to your trusted community organizations. Uh, definitely, you know, visit our MDH website. Uh, we have accurate information, information from, you know, CDC. Um, and so I highly recommend the community to just go on our website. We have, some of our web pages are translated to, and so that makes it easier for the people who, who can't read English and can read in their language. They can um, find that on our website. That's fantastic. Marie? Yeah, I, I, I go in Mary and Dijang. We have come a long way. If people actually come in and check on MDH website right now with the COVID especially, we have all kind of material in many different languages. Also a lot of videos were created in languages that people can actually access easily. Uh, I understand a lot of time you have to know English first to get into MDH, 
but you know, get to someone that you trust in the community, your family member, help them help you accessing that. Once you get in there, you can get all the material you need. Uh, many, many material have been developed in the last few years, and including uh, other area in MDH too, not just the COVID. We, we have learned from that, and we have come a long way creating those things. So, uh, and then also, community organization that where you trusted and that where you know, uh, they all have the information there. And they can always connect it back to us at mm -hmm. the state. And we, since we are there, we certainly can reach out and, and then touch somebody out there easily. That is a really big shift uh, at the institution like, like our state health department. Uh, this is something new. Uh, and the, the fact that there are more of us working there now, we we not just the state employee, we also are committee members. Mm -hmm. we, we come as a person, uh, as a worker, we come with concern of our own people, of, 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 um, of the community, and also we have the responsibility as, a, as an institution uh, worker to actually uh, listen to the voices that you hear and also respond to the voices that you hear. If you want collaboration, if you want relationship, it needs to go both ways. Um, so we are here. Uh, uh, we are the ambassador for the community and we also a responsibility party as the institution to actually making sure our people are healthy. Uh, so that's what we're here for, you know. So. Uh, you can call us state employee, but we still a community member at heart, and that who we are as a person. Mm -hmm. So I, I think um, I'm grateful for our state health department. Actually, as you're enough as a big institution, it's sometimes system is really difficult to change. But the COVID have um, enabled us to do a lot of change for the better for all of us. So. So Minnesota uh, can be healthier, you know, mm -hmm. healthcare access should not be a privilege. Healthcare access should be a right to all, to all people. So true. Well, thank you once again uh, for joining us in this uh, race, racism and health panel. And I'm sure a lot of people who's going to be watching this is going to thank all of you for the great information that you shared today. So thank you again.